Good afternoon, everyone. This is Pastor John Alexander. I'm here with Stephen Wood from Liberty Church of the River Wards. And uh, thanks for joining us for this uh, video, or if you're listening, this recording. Uh, we wanted to take a moment and explain and really walk you through some of the really important rationale for how we ended our sermon series on the Gospel of Mark. If you were with us on Easter Sunday, you noticed that uh, we read Mark's resurrection account in verses 1 through 8 of Mark 16. And then the next week, that was this past Sunday, we didn't preach anymore from the Gospel of Mark. And in fact, we are done our series walking through the Gospel of Mark. That did might it? be, yeah, yeah, well, well, or did we? Okay. Um, yeah. Good question. If you're, if you're an observant uh, congregant and reader of the Gospel of Mark, you might notice that there are some additional verses in the Gospel of Mark. Maybe. Uh, in the ESV, for example, and in most modern translations, right before verse 9 of Mark 16, it'll say, some of the earliest manuscripts do not include Mark 16, verses 9 through 20. And yet here it is in the Bible. So is this part of the Bible? It's printed here, but it's like the publishers of most modern translations are saying, eh, eh, uh, I don't know. We chose not to preach through this last part of Mark 16, frankly, because we're not sure if it's part of the gospel of Mark. And this opens up, as Steve and I, we're going we're to discuss very briefly, a lot of questions, not just about what you do with the gospel of Mark, but what you do with the whole Bible when you come across variant readings or parts of it that we're not sure are original. I don't even know for some of you, if you've ever noticed reading through the Bible, it's not that much of the Bible, but it's not just one or two places either. Right. Where you see a note, we're not sure if this is original or not. So Stephen, I, I don't know, like at what point in your Christian journey, you started to pick up on this reading the Bible. When was it for you? Yeah, I mean, I, I started to pick up on it probably around first when I was in college. And I think the, the first passage that was kind of the alarm bells and asking the question about this is I think John chapter eight, uh, where there's the, the, which is just like this incredibly moving story of Jesus, uh, you know, consoling the, the woman who was caught in adultery and, um, and just, you know, this thing where Jesus draws a line in the sand and, and is writing in the sand and, and says, you know, whoever is, and there's a crowd that's going to stone the woman and they, they and he says to them you know whoever is without sin can cast the first stone it's like this amazing teaching but then you look more closely in the translation you see these brackets um and i was introduced to the the problem more fully in seminary um and it's particularly like a, an issue in the study of the gospels um and you know, there, there are some that have to do with just like one verse or bigger sections like john 8 uh, but the question of Mark 16 is considered the biggest question um, as it relates to manuscripts, variant readings. And if you and if you all have more questions about those throughout the Gospels, um, we, we would love to talk about it more. Um, but yeah, so I've I've thought some about the Mark 16 readings in, in seminary, specifically taking a class on the Gospel of Mark, um, which we can talk about here in a sec. Um, but maybe, maybe we could start by, you said that there are like two, two, like two ways to go with this. One is how it relates to the whole gospel of Mark. And then second off is like, how does this affect our whole understanding of scripture? Um, so maybe those could be like our two headers. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and that'll, it, no matter what we do, it's just going to be the beginning of a conversation. We're not going to get much into John eight today. Um, although it's worth saying that John eight and Mark 16 are kind of far and away the two biggest examples of this in the New Testament. Usually when we're talking about a variant reading, like a we're not so sure type of reading, you're talking about a phrase, you're talking right. about a verse. Um, and uh, today we're just going to talk about Mark 16, but let's let this be the beginning of a conversation, uh, not the end of one. So um, before we uh, go any further, I have a uh, old-fashioned uh, sword drill. Stephen has uh, this game that he plays with uh, our catechumen kids um, 
for catechism class, the elementary kids that are uh, getting ready, some of them to be baptized, all of them are preparing for receiving communion the first, for the first time. If you're not familiar with it, a sword drill is when you throw a passage of scripture out there and you see how fast you can turn to it. So uh, you listeners and your view viewers and Stephen, uh, you're competing, you're racing against Stephen. Um, uh, Mark 15, verse 28, go. It's not very fair. I already have my Bible open. Okay. Well, never... so if you all if you all beat me, that'd be very, very, <laughs> very impressive. Well, just find it and hold it, and I'm going to move on. So, um, for our first question, for just for today, we've set this up a little bit. Essentially, there are three ways the ending of Mark can go. There are three ways the ending can go. The first, and the first way it can go is the longer ending is original, verses nine through twenty. So it wasn't in the earliest manuscripts of the New Testament that have been discovered by archaeologists and historians. It wasn't in the earliest ones, according to tradition, etc. But it might be. It's from some later ones. Maybe those. Maybe, maybe some of those early ones uh, just were uh, not accurate copies. But. This isn't that popular of an option. And Stephen, I don't know if you want to speak to this uh, on, on this position. Are you familiar with some of the ways that this option, that the longer ending versus 9 through 20, is original? Are you familiar with some of the debate about that question? I'm familiar with some of it. I mean, the, the main point that has always stuck out to me that it's, that it's not genuine is just is more is, is syntactic and, and grammatic, grammatical that the way like the vocabulary used in this section is dramatically different than what we see in the rest of the gospel of mark even in even to reading there's a lot of those problems you know you can't always see when you're reading in another language like english but i think even when you're reading this in english you can tell where the the gospel of mark is a is a book that's that's just it doesn't have much rhetoric rhetorical flourish flourish uh but is is just like a hammer pounding a nail hammer pounding a nail this then this then this uses the word immediately all the time uh but you just there's a lot more flourish a lot more different like a wider vocabulary that you find in 9 through 20 that just doesn't seem to fit that's what always stuck out to me among the reasons why yeah, I've, I've read that one. I, um, I got to be honest, I haven't read, I do have some biblical Greek. I've not read and compared, you know, in the original language that closely compared to what the rest of the gospel of Mark uh, reads like. And I didn't even read uh, super carefully in, pre in preparation for this podcast. Um, but I did do uh, just more of a reading of the text in English. And a couple of things that pops up that scholars also refer to is it's like it's pasting in some of the endings of the other gospels right it's yeah. like it's like the end of uh mark 16 1 through 8 it just has the women fleeing the tomb terrified and then it just ends actually the last verse if if verse 8 is the end uh the last word is afraid in english um the last word uh, the, the last verse says uh, they went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonished in astonishment and seized them. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. And frankly, the gospel of Matthew, Luke, and John all end on a much higher note. And you'll even see right very, the very next verse in verse nine, if it's original, I, you know, we'll talk about it. It says when he rose verse nine on the, on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him, etc. This is the ending of the Gospel of John, um, where Mary Magdalene is has this encounter with Jesus, and it's it's this longer, prolonged interaction with Jesus, which I believe also happened. Not all of the Gospels include everything that happened between Jesus and the disciples, even the risen Jesus and the disciples. But at any rate, it's almost like it feels like somebody saying, but actually, Mary didn't just leave terrified. She actually had this other awesome conversation with Jesus. So don't think badly about her, church. Let's give you a little bit more. It just feels like somebody, because almost everybody agrees the gospel writer John wrote decades after Mark. And it's almost like you can imagine somebody has the gospel of Mark and they're like, man, John's ending's just so much more awesome. And then from there, after a few verses of that, she's also, it's also rhetorically awkward that she's reintroduced uh exactly she's, she's right, you know right. she's named in 16 one and then 16 nine it almost as if it's almost as if 
Mark does, is, is reintroducing her as if she, she wasn't just introduced a few verses ago. Right, and she's alone now. It's not her and the other women, which again, as the story goes, it does seem like there were certain interactions with multiple women and then one with Mary alone and then others with other disciples. But at any rate, it's this rigid, jarring change that really, really doesn't flow, um, but is almost meant to look like it should. And then after that, it says in verse 12 and 13, after these things, he appeared in another form to two of them as they were walking into the country. Well, this is the end of the Gospel of Luke yeah. with, the, with uh, a, a guy named Cleopas and the, yeah, the road to Emmaus story where Jesus just appears next to these two dejected disciples. And uh, it's almost like somebody saying, and a little of this happened too. Um, they've read Luke and they want more of this for this, uh, what they feel like is kind of a pathetic ending to the gospel of Mark. And then, and then it ends finally with a version of like a blend of the great commission and Jesus's ascension, which seems like a blend of the end of the gospel of Matthew and the beginning of the book of Acts. So I, I guess this, the, the way to put it is like, when we say it doesn't seem like the ending is original, it doesn't, though, seem like somebody was trying to deceive historically. It's not like somebody like, like an editor came centuries later and was like, I'm craftily going to like confuse all these disciples. They're just saying, hey, if you've only got Mark, there's this other awesome stuff. Right. And if you're carrying it in, in, by the way, writing was ridiculously expensive. Like, if you've got this whole gospel and you can't afford to go get all of Luke or Matthew, let's give you some of the good stuff afterwards so you can disciple your little community of Christians somewhere in the world and, and have more of the story. So with good intentions, it seems like a few centuries later, some redactor came along and added stuff that was not, uh, that was more like a... a like a fill in the blank than it was, I guess we'd say inspired scripture. It's like, Hey, there's this other stuff you don't know about. Let's get it to you. But it wasn't original. It seems. Right. And there's still a lot of good that can be mined out from studying chapters or verses nine through 20. You know, we learn, assuming that this would have, it's like commentators would say is maybe written uh, late second century, early third century, or some of the guesses um, it's, it's helpful to, to know like, oh, well, some of the things that are really nailed down in the section are things that would have been widely believed and received by the early church. Uh, Jesus' resurrection, the centrality of it, um, the doubts of the disciples, you know, uh, this isn't that, this isn't like some Dan Brown con conspiracy where it's like, we're trying to polish the, the beginnings of things to make it as palatable as possible, but no, it's actually like, some of this that's been passed down in the, the the oral tradition of like oh no the disciples doubted um, yeah which actually that that part actually fits with the whole god with the whole gospel of mark but uh and then also that this this really curious wording that jesus gives in the this ver this, this you know late version of the great commission to preach the gospel to all of creation um that mm -hmm. the early church had some understanding of their mission as not just uh communicating a verbal message to fellow human beings, but it had something about Jesus' resurrection had to do with everything. Um, yeah. So there's still really helpful things to be mined wow. out of it, even though we wouldn't say that it's capital S scripture. Right. That's well put. And that's a great point that I didn't pick up on either, that that is differently put in, in like, it's like a, a theologian, let's say, and a, a faithful theologian wanting to like insert, hey, something here is, isn't just for people. Something here is cosmic and right. what happened, you know, in Jesus's resurrection and ascension. Right. Okay, so, so that's, I think, I think more briefly, that's why I think ne neither of us are convinced that this longer ending is original. Though to be fair, some Christians are and no judgment. These are just, this is why it's a question we're giving to you all. Um, sure. The second two options, much, much more simply is, you get if, if if you don't buy that the last uh, twelve verses are original, then you got two choices. Either verse eight of Mark sixteen was the intended end of the gospel, like gospel yeah. writer Mark said. The last note of this whole gospel is people ran away afraid, hearing and seeing that the tomb was empty and being told that Jesus had risen and was going to go ahead of them, but they were terrified and doubting. The end. Right. That's one option that's left. The other option that's left is there was more, but over the course of history, 
it got lost. And we have right. no idea how Mark actually ended. Yeah. Where do you fall on this? So I'm going to go to bat saying I, and I, I think you and I are in the same position. I would go for the second of those two positions. Um, and I just to, to tackle that first one, the, the position that 16.8 is actually the original ending. Uh, so I referenced earlier that I was in a seminary class on the gospel of Mark. And uh, my professor actually tried to take the view that 16.8 was the ending. Um, and some of his reasons for it, uh, one is uh, according to his take on like the, the themes of the gospel of Mark at large, that it, it kind of fits. Like there's themes of silence uh, throughout the gospel of Mark, the disciples not fully understanding what's going on. Uh, and and that's, you know, this, this kind of enigmatic ending um, it, it fits with, with some of those, with some of those themes of it being, you know, it not being the gospel that we would have wanted it to have to be. He also made the case that it, that ending made sense, uh, thinking about Mark's audience, uh, where Mark's audience was, were probably, uh, mixed Jewish, but it's, there's definitely, a, he definitely has a Gentile audience. Um, and that, the, the reason we know that is because of a little aside and chapter seven, I think, uh, a little parenthetical note where Mark explains what Pharisees, why Pharisees would clean themselves, which shows that the, there were these, this letter was written to Gentiles, people who didn't understand they their didn't Pharisaical know the Pharisees practices. Were. Right. So yeah. he's like, these are probably, you know, Gentiles who were starting to be persecuted and were themselves, you know, if this is written in the 60s, around the time of Nero's persecution, perhaps, uh, that they were themselves afraid and astonished and trembling. And Mark's ending this way to try and end with like, hey, the first disciples, we know how it went, you know, you've, this message has come to you in power, but the first disciples too, they started off from a position of being afraid and alone. And so, and, and that, which was a, a really interesting case to make, um, but ultimately I don't find it persuasive um, for a few reasons. Uh, the, the, the first is that, um, it doesn't fit with this rhythm of, of uh, Jesus' disclosures uh, about who he is in the Gospel of Mark. Um, so the, the Gospel of Mark begins in, in chapter 1. And really just look at Mark 1.1 1, 1 and see how this ending compares. Mark 1.1, 1, 1, it's like it's just this thunderous opening, the beginning of the Gospel. Gospel means good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Uh, we learned that he's the Christ, which is the, the Messiah, the anointed one, the coming King. And we learn that he's the son of God. And, um, and we have these self-disclosure moments, basically as the gospel of Mark goes on, it becomes clearer and clearer that Jesus speaks more and more clearly about who he is. Um, so some key epiphany moments are his baptism, um, that where the, you know, God, the father says that this is, is my son, uh, another key one is in chapters eight and nine, where Peter makes a confession that Jesus is, is, uh, is the Christ. Um, and Jesus says, yes, the transfiguration is another one. And then perhaps the most clear one is in chapter 14, uh, before the, the council, which John preached on a few weeks ago, yeah. um, where he says that he's, that Jesus described himself as like the son of man ascending and descending on in the clouds so of heaven. Why, why, why would it not end on yeah. another, aha, this is who he is kind yeah. of moment rather right. than and, running and fleeing and screaming. Yeah. And also, and, and the, the argument my professor made is like, you know, Christ being this like enigmatic silent teacher, which he is at times in Mark as the gospel goes on. He's not, he's actually Mark. The author goes to pains to say Jesus was speaking clearly to them now. Um, and yeah. part of the speaking clearly was that he would rise again on the third day. Um, so it doesn't fit with those themes. Um, another two quick points um, is that like this, having like a subtle enigmatic ending like this is something that you see in like modern literature, uh, but it's not something you really see in ancient biographies. Um, and it, it really would have made Mark stick out in the, like uh, as a sore thumb among the gospels, but also just among like ancient biographies. Um, and, and then yeah, and it's also not, Mark's also not a very subtle gospel. Um, other ones are more subtle. Uh, yeah. Mark is, is more of like a message is like in your face. It's, in, it's intense. Um, and it's, it's clear. I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, not, not to say that everything Jesus says is clear, it's clear. but it's like, yeah. it's, it's this, uh, particularly because we have the sense that it's the first gospel, or at least Mark was aware, it seems like it was circulating among people who had no gospel. Like, this is good news. And like, wouldn't you think it would be a little bit 
just a little bit more. And that's um, that was my last point. It's just that yeah. it's Mark one one, the beginning of the the good news, the the gospel, and this is the ending. Like, it's not a full like trumpeting of the good news. Yeah, it just it just doesn't fit with what the you know the the title of the gospel of Mark in the first sentence. So, so. you'd be saying that like something somewhere just got like you imagine like either this uh, this parchment or uh, probably more likely papyrus early on if it got lost early on um just got worn down in like a it was in somebody's saddle or something and just like fell off the end something or, like or somebody I mean, was yeah. like uh, passing it on and somebody like spilled wine on it and you know the 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 ink you know got runny and they're like oh man we lost some of the gospel we for good it. and so, yeah like, and somehow that version was the one that got copied more than any other yeah it, yeah it's uh yeah i'm no expert on ancient manuscripts but i know that you know if you think about it as like how as a scroll would roll and unroll um and a lot of times like the ancient audiences they, or ancient readers they would treat their scrolls the same way we would treat like i don't know even dvds and like your even those are getting outdated now but you, sometimes you leave them out sitting around uh, or you put them in another place and they get scratched up like the, the the part of the manuscript that was the most fragile would have been the very bottom of it that's where there'd wow. be like a marker to indicate where it was it's the part like as you know they're riding around carrying around unrolling it to read it it's the part that would be okay. most liable to they get pulled away for tear yeah right well, so I'm not actually going to make a case. I think I, it, it's it's plausible. I, th I think I think that that makes a little bit more sense to me. But uh, it's an I think it's okay for it to be a little bit of an open question. Um, you know, was was this the original ending or was there more? What I, what I want to end on is, what does this mean for how we read the Bible? Like, um, if there's stuff in here. One, it's clearly that it's clear that there's a debate, a debate because if everybody thought about it, it, it wouldn't. Everybody thought the same way about it. It wouldn't be in um, in these modern translations of the Bible. Um, and you do have, like, in the NIV, there's a there's a footnote it says we don't we don't know if this is here. In, in the ESV, there's a footnote. Um, I, I I guess I wanna. I want to take that for a second and maybe this will be like our i'll give a final word and Stephen, maybe then you can give a final word for how this sure. impacts your faith and your reading of the bible um so three things first uh I, i've said before earlier but this isn't the only variant reading in the bible it is one of the biggest ones um particularly in the new testament and um Stephen, can you go ahead and, and reference the verse I asked you to look up earlier, Mark 15, 28? It is not there. There it's is not no there. Mark 15, 28. Exactly. So like even earlier, a lot of a lot of us might not have remembered, remembered when we were going through Mark 15, it just went right from Mark 27 to Mark 29. If, if you look in your Bible right now, it'll say that. But there will be a footnote there with Mark 15, 28 in the margin or in the on the bottom of the page and and it just it's basically a gloss verse 28 that um when he was crucified with two robbers one on his right and one on his left someone inserts a verse that says oh by the way this was to fulfill a scripture and so there's a few things one these things are there in little forms throughout along the way got added in as an explanation note that later historians said, as best we can tell, this really, really doesn't seem original, but it's helpful enough to say somebody thought this might be part of it along the way. So that's the first thing. One of the things I think it's really important to understand um, as you begin to notice some of these variants in, uh, in scripture, one of the things that's really increasing my faith, actually, not shaking it, but increasing and making my faith even more confident is uh, the fact that we have a lot of these ancient manuscripts, a lot of them, like nearly 6,000 ancient Greek manuscripts. And the number of the ancient copies that we find, along with their variants, not in spite of their variants, actually increase our confidence in the original. Let me say that again, because that sounded a little complicated. The number of ancient copies that we found, along with their variants, increase our confidence in the original. 
Here's what I mean. Um, let's say that you have uh, uh, two copies of, of the Gospel of Mark and, uh, or fragments of them from the ancient world, you know, a few centuries after Christ. And maybe they have different readings of Mark 15, 28, as we just talked about, or different variants of the end of Mark 16. And they're different on this point, but almost everything else, like 99% plus, is the same. And let's say like that kind of thing keeps happening. Like there are these 1% differences, but 99% is the same. That keeps increasing the confidence of the vast majority of what you have in these ancient manuscripts. And so to, to illustrate that a little bit, let's say that somehow we found the very first copy of the Gospel of Mark that was penned by Mark himself. And we said, this is the original. And we're going to put this original against every translation of Mark that we have in the world. And it's from like mid first century. And like the timing and the dating is right. And the style is right. And we think we've got it. A few things would happen. One, you would never be able to actually authenticate that this very one was by Mark. I mean, scholars would go to war, even if they agreed on the date, they'd be like, well, how can you really know? It might just been some guy down the street who said I'm, said I'm Mark, but I decided to write this myself. How could you really know that that one is the original and it's not been tampered with? That's actually not the better option. The better option to have is these many, many, many hundreds of documents, thousands of documents from all over the ancient world that confirm, that confirm a remarkably uniform message, not uniform in every single verse, but 99% of it has been transmitted. And by the way, I'm not saying 99% to make a point, actually. Um, that's not just a matter of speech. That's something like what we have. Like about 99% of the ancient texts that we have are united in their message. And what's more, that 1% uh, of what's left over is generally stuff like Mark 15, 28. Like, and like, like, it's like a, it's like an, a little bit of an explanation message that maybe wasn't original, but like somebody inserted it to like help a sermon along or something or like a scribe put it in the margin when some translations a few centuries later, it's tends to be stuff like that. And by no means are, are these variants, uh, the kinds of things that would change key doctrines. And the last thing I'll say is this, um, uh, this, there's, there's something like 6,000 ancient Greek manuscripts. And there's a, a book that I recommend you recommend to you called the text of the new Testament. This is kind of a standard by Bruce Metzger and uh, co-author is actually a guy who's not a believer. He's actually pretty antagonistic towards believers. His name's Bart Ehrman. Um, but he, he does get into text criticism and he actually says stuff that actually he doesn't you know, have any qualms with supporting the Christian's positions in this particular area of text criticism, because it's just frankly true. Um, but he says this about how the, the manuscripts we have of the New Testament compare with other ancient manuscripts. So he says, we can appreciate how bountiful the attestation is for the New Testament if we compare the surviving textual materials of other ancient authors who wrote during the early centuries of Christianity. For example, the compendious history of Rome written by Velius Paterculus survived in only one incomplete manuscript discovered in 1515 at an abbey in Alsace. And he says, in contrast with texts like this, the textual critic of the New Testament is embarrassed by the wealth of material. Furthermore, the work of many ancient authors has been preserved only in manuscripts that date from the Middle Ages, sometimes the late Middle Ages, far removed from the time at which they lived and wrote. On the contrary, the time between the composition of the books of the New Testament and the earliest extant copies is relatively brief. Instead of the lapse of a millennium or more, as is the case of not a few classical authors, several papyrus manuscripts of portions of the New Testament are extant that were copied within a century or so after the composition of the original documents. So all that is to say, um, it's important to recognize just how vast the evidence is that just 
uh, overwhelms any other ancient documents. What we have in, in terms of documents that are transcriptions of the original New Testament works are really remarkable. Yeah, that's the, the you're hitting on the, the points that I would have closed that I would have closed with too. Uh, just that the a lot of times it's presented as like a if you go read in some circles, you know, it's like the problems, the problem of the gospels, uh, that there are all these, you know, that there are these questions of variance over these little itty bits and pieces here and there with some large pieces like we've talked about. But really you can flip that on its head and be like, this actually isn't, this is this isn't a problem. This is actually a sign of 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 authenticity and a sign of wide reception that there are so many manuscript and especially like you noted with the the Bart Ehrman quote in comparison with other ancient ancient documents that don't receive the kind of scrutiny that the New Testament does um and then I, I suppose I, I want to try and say this carefully uh, like a a concluding point that I would have um is just that um the New Testament or, or the, the scriptures as a whole without losing an ounce of their their divine authorship and their divine authority. Um, they are real world documents from across a thousand a thousand years, written on you know authors from different continents, um, and and uh, these these documents have been you know passed authored by God through the instrument instruments of of men, um, and they've been passed down to us by by men in the real world, you know, people riding on horses uh, to deliver messages that have a, that a scroll that's next to them. Like this, as I actually find something like of the, the presence of these problems or, um, you know, eyewitness account, like, uh, you know, the, some of the different perspectives you see in the gospels is actually a kind of compelling proof to me of the, 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 the truth of the, 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 the authenticity, the authority of scripture, just that unlike, uh, other religions like say say islam where the god spoke directly to muhammad who directly wrote every word down um or or for, for the quran or another like closer to modern day example of that would be mormonism and joseph smith uh translating the scrolls you get you, you end up having the entire witness the entire authority of the divine scriptures resting on the character of one flawed human being and with with the new testament we have this this allegedly problem uh, of having multiple witnesses uh to jesus to, to the the birth life death and resurrection of jesus and now we're trying to figure out how all of these how we, how all of these 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 different very vivid eyewitness accounts can be harmonized um it just it just goes to show the um yeah that's is uh, is there are lots of eyewitnesses and it's it made a, a, an immediate wide splash um that we now have the the joy of seeing in our scriptures and uh trying to fit all fit all together so i think that's i think that's all i would say and i guess if there's any anyone who's listening to this and is, and is like really rattled by these questions wants to get get down to the, to the bottom of it um uh john or i or victor or Larry or other women's or other uh, women leaders or whoever would probably would love to, to talk with you about it because um, we're I'm sure not the only ones who've thought about this question uh, the bigger question or the smaller question about this passage so I think I'll leave it at that yeah and this isn't intended to be an entire class on the doctrine of scripture either but like a focus in on how did the bible come down to us and what does it feel like to read it and see these things that like we're not sure if every verse was original and yet we keep actually getting closer and closer. Um, and uh, there's this remarkable witness to, to what is there to the extent that we still say it's Holy Scripture. You know, it's uh, what we have here is God's authoritative word that, you know, we have almost all of, you know. Um, so uh, with that, with that, uh, let me end there and say, uh, keep the questions coming and God bless you all. We hope to catch up with you soon. Peace.